First Samuel. Last week we saw the absolute surrender of Hannah. She had promised that if God would give her a son, that she would give him back to the Lord to serve him in the tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle located? What town? Shiloh. Shiloh, north. About 15 miles north from Ramah, where Samuel and Elkanah and Hannah and Peninnah lived. About 15 miles north was Shiloh. And so... She went home after she had made this promise to God. She did conceive. She did bear a son. She called him Samuel. She stayed home from their annual trek to Shiloh until she had weaned Samuel. Remember, that would probably, in this culture, be three or four years old before the child was weaned. And then she took him up to Shiloh and went home. She left her son in Shiloh. Her prayer is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 1 through 10, and then we read in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 2, that's where we'll pick up here this evening, we read, And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, we're not going to be long tonight, but we there are some lessons that we can learn just in a, a very few verses here in 1 Samuel. We've got a fellowship coming after this, so we'll feed you too, so I can go longer, right? Okay. Elkanah is going home to Ramah, Hannah goes home to Ramah, and Samuel stays there. She did the hardest thing that a parent could ever do. She left her child, walked away, leaving him in less than capable or dependable hands, as we'll see tonight. Eli was not a prize-winning father. As a matter of fact, he was a terrible father. He would lose much over it, and we'll look at that tonight. But Hannah's confidence was not in Eli. Her confidence was in the hand of omnipotent God to watch out and care for her son in what did amount to be a sometimes less than desirable situation. Because, we read in verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. This isn't the first use of this word Belial. It's used in chapter 1, verse 16, when Hannah was praying and Eli thought she was drunk. She said, no, 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 I'm not a daughter of Belial, she says in verse chapter 1, verse 16. Belial means worthless or good for nothing. So a son of Belial, it, it usually has included in it in, in biblical context... When we read of Belial, it usually has the idea of some sort of a, 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 an immoral context. It's, it's, it's bad morally and, and even in, in sexual immorality. The Hebrew word Belial is found 27 times in the Old Testament. It's translated, obviously, as Belial, wicked, ungodly, evil, and naughty. All of these to describe Belial. The names of Eli's two sons. Do you remember what they were? Hophni and Phinehas. We're told that they, here in this, this verse, verse 12, that they knew not the Lord. Now they were engaged in full-time service. They, they made their living in the service of Jehovah. But they didn't know him. They certainly knew about the Lord, didn't they? Do you, you suppose that the sons of Eli, the high priest, knew about Jehovah? Absolutely. They would have known the law. They'd have had to, to, to do what they did, to, to even carry on the facade, as we'll see that they did. But they were lacking a relationship with Jehovah. They knew about him. They had a head knowledge, but they had no heart relationship with Jehovah. And the verses that follow reveal how they manifest their worthlessness, how they manifested themselves as sons of Belial. And we've got, we've got three or four different ways that they did this, four different ways. We're going to look at them, then we're going to make an application. So follow along with me. I'll talk fast. You listen fast, okay? Number one, they were children of Belial because they ignored God's plan. Look at verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, 
The priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh had brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Now, this is not how it was supposed to work. We can read how it was supposed to work in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. The portion of the priest, where did the priest get their food? Because they didn't have all of the land. They didn't have all of the, the things that all the other tribes did. The way that the priests were fed is by the sacrifices. That was okay. That was God's plan for them. As a matter of fact, we read in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 31, And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. So they made the burnt sacrifice. They would portion out the animal. They would burn the fat. They would keep the meat. And that was God's plan for them. That was how God planned for the priest to be sustained. Verse 32 of Leviticus 7 says, And the right shoulder shall ye give unto the priest for an heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. So, it's not that they were taking meat from the sacrifice. They were supposed to. Their problem was they were taking more. They were when it says that they took a flesh hook, they would go in, and the, the meat that was offered to the Lord would go into this, this cauldron, this kettle. And the, the Bible gives us four different words for it. And, and they would send their servant. Hophni and Phinehas would send their servant out, and they, they would have what God had ordained for them to have, but they wanted more. So they'd send their servant out, and he would go fishing in the offering of the Lord. Now... If, if while if we, we haven't passed the plate here in a good long time, but, but if, if we were passing the offering plate, you saw somebody start taking stuff out of the offering plate. You know, they dropped something in and took something out. You, you'd say, probably shouldn't do that because that money's been given to God. The same is true here. You don't, you don't go fishing in God's offering for food. God has ordained that you have food. In this case, did you offer the best animals or the worst animals? The best. the best. So the children of, of the priests, they were already getting the very best that there was. But they wanted more. So they were, they were avoiding God's way. They ignored God's plan. Deuteronomy 18 verse 3 says, And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep. And they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw or the belly. Hophni and Phinehas not satisfied with the meat that God ordained them to have, ignored God's plan, and sent a servant fishing in the offering. That's not good. They ignored God's plan. Number two, they took God's portion. So it, it gets worse. Look at verse 15. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came. I don't know why they sent their servant to do all their dirty work, but they did. The servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden or boiled flesh of thee, but raw. Hophni and Phinehas would send their servant out to confront people before they had burnt their sacrifice and demand untrimmed meat. Now, they wanted meat with the fat on it. Now, you say, big deal. Well, remember Leviticus 7.31? Leviticus 7.31 says, And the priest shall do what with the fat? Burn the fat. Okay. Why would they want the meat with the fat on it? Why do you want meat with fat on it? Because it tastes better. Okay. So I, I don't hold them guilty for liking meat with fat on it. If they wanted meat like that, they could have gone out and bought it. But they were stealing it from God. They were taking God's portion. God said... This part of the meat you burn. This part of the meat you give to the priest. They said, I want all of it. And they took God's portion of the sacrifice. <clears throat> they weren't even secretive about it. Look at verse 16. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth. So people knew what they were up to. And people would say, wait, wait, wait. okay, okay, you can, you can take it. Just make sure you burn the fat because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what God told us to do in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy. But what did they do? Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. 
They wanted fat on their meat, and they were willing to get physically violent to get it. You'd say, this is kind of silly. All for, all for wanting that? They were taking God's portion to themselves, and they were willing to get physically violent to accomplish it. So, number one, they, they ignored God's plan. Number two, they took God's portion. Number three, why, why, were they, why were they sons of Belial? Number three, because they placed no value on spiritual things. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. To abhor means to spurn, to despise, or to blaspheme. They had no respect for the offering of the Lord, and consequently, people, other people started not having respect for it. These were the sons of the high priests. They were of the line of Aaron. When Eli died, who by rights should have taken his place? Hophni or Phinehas. And if one of them died, then the other would. That's the way that it should have been. They were the ones who were supposed to be closest to God. They would be the ones who would take the blood and apply it to the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. They were those. They, they should have known better. But they placed no value on spiritual things. Genesis 25 gives us the story of Jacob and Esau. Do you remember what it says about them? Which one was older, Jacob or Esau? Esau. And being the firstborn, he would get the birthright. Which is a pretty big deal when your granddaddy is Abraham and when your father is Isaac. Being the, being the firstborn and getting the birthright means you get the Abrahamic covenant, right? Which means you get the land, you get a seed, and you get to have Messiah come through your line. So it's a big deal. Well, but one day Esau got, he got hungry and he traded his birthright for how much gold? No gold. What, what did he trade it for? A bowl of soup. How, how, what's the best soup you've ever had? Man, it, I've had some good soup in my life, but really? Worth trading the Abrahamic covenant for? Worth trading the birthright from Abraham and Isaac? Not, not hardly. But the Bible tells us in Genesis 25, 34... Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up, went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Same idea as Hophni and Phinehas. They put no value in spiritual things. Esau valued spiritual blessings on the same level with soup. That's significant. So they placed no value on spiritual things. And then, number four, why were they sons of Belial? Because they even defiled those who came to worship. Their attitude of contempt towards God and his worship not only affected their offerings, but skip ahead to verse 22. We'll look at this in detail next week. <clears throat> but take a look at verse 22. It says, Now Eli was very old and heard all his sons did unto all Israel. And how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That their, their, their level of debauchery knows no bounds, it seems. They're, they're taking God's portion. And, and now they're defiling those who come to worship Jehovah in the tabernacle. And this is the setting in which Hannah left her son. These guys were the other kids in the house. That's pretty rough, isn't it? Sons of Belial. Now, we're not done with Hophni and Phinehas, but let me give you some application, okay? Here's the application. Let's do a spiritual checkup. You, right now, we've, we've moved fast. We've got four things. We're going to check four things before we're done tonight, okay? Number one, they ignored God's plan. They ignored God's plan for how it was supposed to be. They made their own way. And God has a plan for each of our lives. Would you agree? Yes. God got a plan for your life? Now, I'm not, I'm not giving the, the Joel Osteen speech of God has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants you to have rainbows and butterflies all the time. Because that's just not the case. Is it? 
No, contrary to popular opinion and certain TV preachers, God's plan for his children is not always rainbows and sprinkles. Okay? There will be times that it's going to be hard. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We just sang, Am I a soldier of the cross? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me unto God? No, it's not. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. There will be plenty of opportunities and temptations for us to get what we want without the, without the suffering that comes from godliness. Do you remember Satan tempted Christ with the kingdoms of the world? He said, you can have the kingdoms, you can have the glory, and, and no cross. What do you have to do? What, what would Jesus have had to do? Now, Satan's a liar, obviously, but what did Satan say he had to do? Fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all this. And Jesus said, no. Because <laughs> Jesus knows better, doesn't he? Because we read in Revelation where the Bible says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Jesus has the nations of the world. All the glory of the world is coming to him anyway, but the path to glory went through Calvary, didn't it? And God has a plan for your life, but it may lead through some deep shadows from time to time. God intended to give the kingdoms of the world to Christ, but suffering was in the path. The same is true for you and me. Do we ignore God's plan? They did, and they were called the children of Belial for it. Number two, ch check yourself on this. They took God's portion. Say, I can't do that because we don't have an offering like that, and I've never taken anything out of the offering. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. You, if you came and you stole the flower arrangement from the church, you'd be wrong to do it. You might get caught. You might not. You steal God's glory. It's a big deal. Why? Because he's the only one worthy of the Lord. When I accept the praise for what only God can do as if I accomplished it myself, I'm taking God's glory and he takes it seriously. Mm -hmm. it, made, it made Hophni and Phinehas, they went down in history, and, and they'll go further down in history as we go on. They went down in history as sons of Belial because they took God's portion. And God has redeemed us and saved us for his glory. And for me to steal his glory is no better than them fishing in the offering plate. No better than them having people. No, you give me what I want now. And if you don't, I'll beat you up for it. You don't do it. Check yourself. Number three. They place no value on spiritual things. They place no value on spiritual things. Psalm 10, verse 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Meaning, a symptom of wickedness is what? To not have God in all your thoughts. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? You think about God all the time? See, I try, but I don't sometimes. Sometimes I'm thinking about other things. In James chapter 4, we're told of the evils of planning our lives without God. To, to make plans. You say, well, this year I'm going to do this. Next year I'm going to do this. I'm going to build my empire. And the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The good that we would know to do is to involve God in our plan. But sometimes we don't. If you have your life mapped out and you know exactly what you're going to do and how it's going to go and God is not part of it, you're wrong. And I am too. When we plan life without God, 
We're placing no value on spiritual things. Check yourself. Number four, they were called sons of Belial because they defiled those who came to worship. You say, well, at least we're not doing that, right? Well, we're, we're certainly not, we're not guilty of what they did. They were lying with the women in the gate of, of the temple, of, of the tabernacle. Certainly we're not doing that. Let me give you a verse that you've, you've heard a lot. This is written to believers, so this is written to you and me. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Sin that goes unconfessed and undealt with can defile those with whom I join in worship. When, when we gather together, and I love getting together. It's a lot of fun to get together, to fellowship, to get into God's word. Unconfessed, undealt with sin. Bitterness, especially, is listed here in Hebrews. Bitterness will eat you alive, and it will eat those you love alive. Because why? It's just the nature of the beast. It's how it works. So in conclusion... Spiritual checkup tonight. They were sons of Belial because they ignored God's plan. They took God's portion. They placed no value on spiritual things. They defiled those who came to worship. And if we're not careful, we can too. All four of those things. And if, if we're all honest, we probably have to admit that there have been times when we've struggled with at least some of these. Where we don't put value on spiritual things like we should. When we, when we have allowed sin in our life to be a defiling influence on others. Take some time and consider these things that we've examined tonight. Just very, very brief tonight. Don't allow yourself to be made worthless. That's what Belial means. They were made worthless because they didn't deal with sin the way they should have. It should come as a great warning to you and to me. Let's bow for a word of prayer. We'll bless the food while we're, while we're praying here, and then we will proceed on down the stairs. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we've taken just a little bit of time tonight to look at two men who we know about, Lord, but certainly not to look up to, but we know about them because they were worthless in your sight. Lord, they, they didn't amount to what they could have. You had greater plans for them, but they forfeited it because of sin. Pray that you'd help us to be wary, to be watchful, that we don't allow those sins to creep into our lives, to defile us, and to defile others. I pray that you'd bless uh, everyone who's come tonight. I thank you for each and every one of them. I pray that you would be with us now as we go down and have fellowship. I pray that you'd bless the food to our bodies. Bless our bodies for your service. Bless our fellowship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.